Hi, okay, so here I am with William J. Broad, um, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist um, for the New York Times and who has just released a book was, which has re re reached a certain level of infamy already, even though it just was uh, technically released yesterday. It's called The Science of Yoga. So I'm going to ask him a few questions about the book and um, various projects and yoga, of course. So we're going to jump right into it. So hi, William. Hi, great hi. to be here. Good to be here, yeah. So, okay, my first question for you. Um, there was a there was an excerpt in the New York Times about a month ago, uh, before the release of the book, and uh, how yoga can wreck your body was the was the the title of the excerpt. The, the, the fetching headline, yeah. Yeah, the fetching headline. So I I'm really curious to know how you how how you felt about the the response and the reaction and the the sort of viral nature or, of that article or, and or how i felt about the headline because it was as much a surprise to me as uh the readers probably i bet yeah i had seen the headline in the magazine mm -hmm. print the print copy which was all bent out of shape which is a very different sort of subtle under you know you know it's evocative right it's not like a sledgehammer <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah so, Yoga can wreck your body is quite edgy. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm um, that the choice to include that chapter as an excerpt um, was that was that your choice or was it the magazine's choice or no? It was the, it was the magazine's choice. They looked at the book and they decided that this there was strong science mm -hmm. and that it was something they were interested in and they ran with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, the, the maelstrom of, of discussion and conversation and re response around that. How, how did you, I mean, it generated a lot of buzz. Sure. Good, well, so. authors, authors like buzz, right? Yeah. So, um, but the, I think, you know, and I, I guess in the yoga community, I'm seen as a basher now because of that narrow slice of the book. And, yeah. you know, it's like, who is this guy? But the big surprising thing to me was the huge, and I mean huge, positive response mm. that I got as a journalist from, you know, emails all around the world. Lots of people saying, great stuff. We really appreciate your laying this out. And then a surprising number of two other categories. One, people who had suffered serious injuries, right? Mm. Me Too cases. Some, some of the... Um, Subject lines would be my horror story, that kind of thing, right? Where people would go on about their own injury. The other thing that surprised me, kind of blew me away, was the the reformers, who I talk about more in the book, you know, than I do in the magazine excerpt. But they're, to my surprise, and if I had known this ahead of time, I would have made this a bigger part of the book. There are lots and lots and lots of interesting people out there that are taking yoga as we've kind of received it and refining it. Yeah. making it better, making it safer in lots of ways. And I I knew that was happening. I, I charted it a little bit in the book with the Iyengar people and how, you know, use blankets, props, let's be smart about this. Not all bodies are made the same. Let's customize the poses so that they're not so stressful. Um, but the the depth and breadth of that, which I only learned about really, um, you know, through the the response to the article surprised me a lot. So, who, what are some of the reformers? Who are some of these these groups or people who came forward just as a just as well, out of curiosity, I, like I one example? Group. Let's see if I have that file here. Uh, oh, you start, ah, start a file. file. That's amazing. Yeah, well, it's a file. Like you can see at the top here. Like here's all the injuries: it's a letter about stroke, spinal stenosis, wow, uh, vertigo for a year, huh. C six, C seven. Uh, rupture, <laughs> um, spinal infarct, disc injury. <laughs> These are, mm. I mean, it just, it, like, it was a lot. But then you also get things like Smarter Bodies. Mm. Do you know Smarter Bodies? No, I haven't heard of Smarter Bodies. Uh, they're a group of yogis here in New York City. So they go on, they're going to interview me, I think, later today or tomorrow. We are yoga teachers who agree wholeheartedly with the recent article you wrote. I'm sure you're aware of the intense reactions to yoga teachers who have been offended by what Glenn Black had to say. But we are yoga teachers who think that it's this kind of perspective is critical to the evolution of yoga in America as a beneficial practice. They're taking yoga and they're working with it, right? And they aren't the only ones. There's lots of people out there, it turns out, to my surprise, who think yoga is A, a good thing, but B, it can be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you, and, which seems... Seems to be your shtick too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, well, you you allude to that in your in your in your epilogue, and I think that's kind of a thread going through as well. That that yoga is a dynamic, changing, you know, evolving practice right. and 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 you know, um, system. So. Um, I really appreciated in the end how you acknowledge that uh, that yoga is at a turning point. In, in, in a recent interview, you called it a wonderful juncture. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you say a little bit more about that, about, about this turning point that is at, and, and sort of where, where yoga can go if it, you know... Well, I, my strong prejudice is to science. I'm a science journalist. I have been for way too long. And, you know, it's, the book looks at a century and a half of science investigating yoga, right? And I'm very proud of that. Nobody's ever put that together before. But the, to me, the most exciting part of this is that the best science, the really good science, has only been happening in the last five, ten years, right? Mm-hmm. Real, like federal money, National Institutes of Health in the United States. They, do very, they fund very careful studies at elite institutions with control groups and all those kind of things that you know hard scientists love. And their research is starting to produce some of the really clean, really illuminating results, like that yoga releases GABA, this Mm -hmm. important neurotransmitter that is really uh, amazing for lifting moods. It works as an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. Who knew, right? Yoga does it. Mm -hmm. And um, so the turning point for me, and it's maybe it's naive Midwest in enthusiasm. I grew up in Milwaukee, and I and and I tend to be an optimistic person. But I I see one possibility for yoga is it, is it becoming more scientific, right? As it growing as it grows and evolves in tune with new insights from science. Hmm. That if that happens, I think it can go wild and become a huge mainstream. Uh, practice for people, you know, both for disease pre- prevention, for healing, you know, you can envision yoga doctors, um, yoga colleges, you know, where they have, you know, very serious science curricula and serious certifications. I mean, you know, mo- most people think of yoga as old. I think it's possible to think of yoga as virtually in the early stages of just being born. So um, I'm, I'm curious to know, in, in the research that you, I mean, I'm assuming it was extensive research that you did on the, on the, on the topic of yoga and, and, the, and the studies, um, what was the most surprising thing that you learned about the practice? Well, generally, you know, the big surprise, I mean, I had been a <clears throat> kind of a middle-of-the-road, mediocre yoga practitioner for a long time, mostly for stress management, right? Um, I do a lot of investigative work at the New York Times, a lot of things having to do with biological weapons and nasty things that can kill you. So yoga was like a big relief for me. And in my own mind, I associated yoga mostly with stress management, feeling good, being able to unplug and center, that kind of stuff, right? The big surprise was Yoga is so much more. Mm. Yoga, more so than sports, more so than any other activity, I think, in life, has these potential extremes for being really good and really astonishingly beneficial or really bad. You know, it will kill you. These strokes, you know, one out of 20 people who get these kind of uh, what they call arterial dissections that lead to clots in your brain die. And, you know, the clinical literature is very clear. Strokes are a recurring danger for some of these uh, poses that flex your neck a lot, uh, shoulder stand or plow, that kind of stuff. It's a serious issue. And I've been criticized. People say, well, that literature is old. Hmm. You're right. Those problems were identified in the 70s and 80s. And what happens in medical journals is the same as anywhere. Once the problem has been identified, it becomes old news. Journal editors don't accept new you know, uh, articles about stroke, but trust me, people keep having stroke. This very bad stuff was surprising, as was the very good stuff. Mm. And the thing that totally blew my mind was sex, right? Divine sex. It took me a long time to clarify the science. Um, you know, it really took about three years that I had to think about it, look, go through the literature, because there was contradictory evidence. Right. 
that I had to piece through and say, why is it contradictory? Why do these sketchy studies not get it? I could feel, you know, hormones in my own body, and it seemed highly unlikely that yoga would actually reduce, you know, certain sexual hormones. But that's what some of the research said. So I had to get my hands around the complexity of it. But then, you know, it turns out that across the board, you know, in terms of hormones, in terms of brain waves, in terms of, you know, interesting studies done at the uh, University of British Columbia, um, you know, in terms of fast breathing, right? Um, Bastrika, or these things that people do all the time at, at the end of yoga classes, you know, is, are very sexually arousing. They've measured this stuff. Uh, I won't, let's not go into the details, but, you know, it's in the book. And, um, and even on the further spectrum, which just blew my mind, spontaneous orgasms, thinking off, you know, th this is, gets into extremely deep water, which I'm still wrestling with and still wondering about. You know, to what extent is the conception of ancient spirituality that we all have about yoga, to what extent can that be explained by extreme states of sexual ecstasy? Mm. That any physiologist, you know, on the street would say, well, they've simply entered a long orgasm, right? I mean... I think those are real questions, and that that I went into this material that that was the last thing that you know was on my mind, and right now I think, hmm, is that your next book? <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty wild. <laughs> well, again, it's also I think that there's um there's another there's you know the debates within the yoga community about the sort of sexualization of yoga and trying to keep. Um, the class, you know, the, the yoga studio and the yoga classroom, a safe space for people, and so there's this there's this kind yeah. of inherent huge big issue. Well, yeah, Contra you got all these young, you know, yeah. healthy people doing heavy breathing and lots of other stuff, and you know, things happen, right? So that's a it works on all. Yeah, there's no question. All the, the physiological evidence is very strong that it stirs the sexual fires and you know is sexually arousing. So, which I think is fascinating. But also it may be dangerous. There, as it says in the book, you know, there's this whole Sex in the City episode where Samantha the Yogasm. Yogasm, yeah, which gets picked up by the New Yorker. It's, mm -hmm. you know, cartoons, you know. Mm -hmm. Tonight, hon, I had a yogasm in class, you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's definitely already it's already been it's already been exploited, the yoga through you know, better sex through yoga series. Right? And there's no, no, I've no got shortage those, of you, never I never watched the advanced one, just the beginning. <laughs> TMI, TMI. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, just where your practice is right now, where your yoga practice is right now, and um, are you going to continue to research and, and write about yoga, or are you moving on to other areas of interest? To answer the last question first, I, mm -hmm. I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to survive this book because there mm -hmm. has been a much bigger reaction than I expected, so... Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm holding on for dear life. Um, whether, you know, there's another book or more. I mean, I've got so much material and so many questions. I could write three books, right? But mm. whether or not anybody's interested in them or whether I'm interested in them, I don't know. Um, what, what was the, oh, my own practice. Um, yeah, where's your practice? Well, I'm, a science, I'm a science journalist. I don't want to go into my practice. What I'll say is I do, I've got two jobs, right? I work for the New York Times. I also write books. I also have three kids. And in that right there, you know that I don't have a lot of time for other stuff. Um, I do about, you know, on a good day, I'll do about 20 minutes of asanas, 20 minutes of breathing and relaxation. And, that, and sometimes I can't do that, right? Sometimes uh, I don't have the time. One thing, though, that has dramatically changed is I will not do a shoulder stand. I will not do a plow. I will do a headstand gingerly and infrequently. Well, um, this has been really interesting. I still have about 18 questions for you, but <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe we can do round two. You yeah, know? That, that would be great.